Um, the, the remainder of Tim's time is uh, spent as a professor of satellite geodesy at the University of Leeds. Um, and he founded SatSense in 2018 to develop and implement solutions that use satellite radar interferometry for monitoring stability of all sorts of things. Uh, and I guess we'll find more out around that over the coming out. Great, excellent. So, so to you, Tim. Well, thank you for the invitation. Do we need to set recording or anything? Uh, it, should, it should already be recording. Brilliant, excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. So this is um, an update on a talk I gave in Doncaster. It was uh, November 2021, which was the first like in-person talk post-lockdown. So there are only a few people in the room, um, but lots online. It's great to see so many people here face to face. It's so much easier speaking to real humans than it is into the void. Um, Thinking to hundred million humans, but it's all switched up their cameras. In there. Anyway, that's the, so I'm distracted. So I want to talk to you today about kind of progress. Um, in the last few years, we've been making work with Network Rail, um, implementing some of this technology um, called Satellite Radar Interferometry, or INSAR for short. Um, and I want to try and give a fairly objective assessment. So it's not a technology that always works, but it has some um, some interesting use cases, I think, which um, um, which are now being implemented by uh, Network Rail. So I'll talk about the challenge. I'll talk a bit about the technology, what it is. Um, Focus a little bit on what when it works, when it doesn't work, what kinds of things we can use it for, um, and then go through some different use cases, the way you can use this technology uh, for asset management, and then have a kind of think about where we're going with this. And we're at a point where the technology is developing really rapidly, and there's lots of exciting things in the future. Okay, so I think you're all much more familiar with the challenge here than, than, than I am in terms of um, the impact of ground movement. You know, landslips, uh, bridge collapses, etc. All of these are kind of major um, disruptive events for the for the rail network. Um, you know, and there's obviously a lot of, of earthworks, only ninety thousand earthworks, um, and lots of are old. Again, you're very familiar with all these challenges, and you know, there's a lot of continued failures of those um, weathering. Um, and I think with climate change, these things are going to get worse potentially into the future. Um, so, um, in this review from uh, 2021 uh, by uh, Lord Robert Mayer, he specifically mentioned the technology in SAR as a potential one of the things that Network Rail um, should be uh, looking at. And so, um, part, and partly in response to that, um, there was a uh, uh, some R and D funding from Network Rail to work with that sense. Um, and we've been collaborating the last few years. Um, to really test uh, inside possibilities. It was, it was looked at um, you know, five, ten years ago when the technology was not so mature and things have changed quite a lot, particularly with uh, some of the newer satellites we've got launched. So I'll show the latest results from this collaboration and in particular want to thank Simon Abbott, uh, Stephen Brooks, um, Emmanuel, uh, Emmanuel uh, Sukalis and, and Lady Harper and Edward Rail. Um, so um, in sum, What's it all about? So this is a kind of cartoon of how technology works. We're talking about satellite radars um, flying um, in space. So this is Sentinel-1 here. That's flying at about 600 kilometers above the Earth's surface. So this diagram isn't to scale. Um, it's sending radar waves down. Uh, they've got a wavelength of about six centimeters. So there's actually 30 million or so radar waves between the satellite um, from the ground. Um, and what we're doing is we're measuring very small movements by exploiting different shifts in the waves. So we're measuring the, the phase shifts of those. And that's why it's an interferometric technique. And that gives us insight into how the ground is behaving, whether it's subsiding or, or heaving or indeed moving, moving laterally. Um, and of course, that has great benefits. If this was a perfect technology, we wouldn't need to fit sites to monitor, uh, uh, monitor things. Uh, we can lower risk uh, to personnel, it reduces carbon footprint um, and, um, and reduces uh, disruption. Uh, to the network by having to close, close sites for access. So just to dig in a little bit, so this is a, a, a cartoon for how this uh, works. So this is um, this is a time series. We get a stack of radar images, and what we do is we process those. This is Ripon, um, not too far from here, and where we can make a measurement, and we can't make measurements everywhere, but where we can make measurements 
we can look at the average change in the rate of, mo of movement for those points and we can color those up white if they're not moving, red if they're moving away from the satellite, blue if they're um, uplifting. And so if we zoom in there on this, you can see that red section there. Actually, we can, for each of these points, we've got a detailed time series. Um, from the satellite, we use pri primar primarily, which is Sentinel-1. That goes back to the beginning of 2015. Um, and we get these time series, and you can see there's some movement here. This is, I'll show a bunch of these graphs. So generally, the, the time on this axis, uh, movement in millimeters here. So this is two centimeters of movement. You can see this move points move gradually away from the satellite. It kind of changed a bit here. There's a bit of a kink in the time series. But actually, this is when a, a sinkhole would have been up underneath, so underneath the, uh, the sink in the middle of the uh, ribbon. And you can see the change in the time. Period. Um, okay, so some things you need to know about technology. First, it's not an off the shelf product. Um, I've been working with this technology since the late 90s, um, mostly looking at earthquakes and volcanoes and those kind of things. And, um, and so there's a huge amount of scientific research that's gone into developing these algorithms, and we've been applying them uh, in, into SatSense um, to build this technology that can, we think is useful in, in the rail industry. Um, but it's not. There's a number of providers of the technology, and all the algorithms are slightly different and continually evolving. But it, it's not something you just get downloading the satellite. You have to process the data. Um, mentioned it doesn't work everywhere before. So this is a 3D view. Uh, this is Folkestone Warren, the Folkestone Warren landslide, and I'll talk more about that later. It's the railway track going across the across from the cliff face here, and that's uh, continually moving a uh, real big headache. Uh, kind of, uh, that place to run a railway, really, uh, but it's there. And, um, so um, you can see that we get these measurement points, and they're not evenly distributed. So we don't tend to get points where the ground scattering characteristics change. So that typically is where you've got dense vegetation or things like agricultural fields, where fields are being found periodically. Where we get good measurements are things like bare rock surfaces, um, buildings, um, and uh, sometimes in terms of sparsely educated uh, areas as well. So it's a, it's a distribution and we're relying, um, if we just rely on natural reflectors, we're not in control of where those reflections come from. Um, but again, we can get a nice time series showing the movement. In this case, we've got something like uh, seven centimeters of movement um, over that time period. Um, the other thing, it only measures movement in the direction the satellite is looking. Um, and it's a radar satellite. It doesn't look straight down. It looks to the side. Um, and the satellites in what's called a polar orbit, so going around the Earth like that, get one image of the satellite going from south to north. Then imagine the Earth rotating, and you get one um, on the other side of the satellite goes from north to south. Um, and they, they look, because it looks to one side, you get two different viewing directions. And we color those up basically the movement whether the, the color red is when the, the movement is away from the satellite and blue when it's towards the satellite. So in this case, in this image here, these are some landslides um, just south of Kirby Stephen. Um, and um, you can see this at the bottom of the valley here, the top of the valley here. Um, these blue areas are the, the slope and stability moving down the hill. They're moving that way. They're moving towards the satellite in this case, largely to the west. Um, and so they've got that blue color. If we look, in the image with the satellite flying from north to south, it's looking in this direction. Now they're moving away from the satellite. But this is more horizontal movement in this case than vertical movement. So you can say something about whether it's horizontal movement or, or vertical movement or the relative contribution of those. But with, because of the geometry of the satellite, it mostly sensitive to east west motion and vertical movement, vertical movement, relatively insensitive to north south movement. Um, the other thing is, this is not continually imaging the Earth. We're relying on when the satellite comes over. Um, and um, there's, in some times, it's going to be updated a few hours um, after each uh, satellite position. So um, every six or 12 days in the UK for the Sentinel 1 satellite, which, which we primarily use. Um, and so it's not the solution for the threat of kind of rapid earthwork or infrastructure failures. So you're not going to get a kind of one hour warning from the Earth. Really, the primary primary use case of this is, is slower moving 
sites, sites that we know are unstable, monitoring those, those identifying new sites we didn't know. And there's a bunch of science satellites up there. This is a timeline, actually, there's, there's even more now if we updated this image. Um, but actually, not all of them are useful for this. Um, the main ones that we use um, at the moment is a satellite called Sentinel One, which is a constellation of a should be a couple of satellites. One of them isn't working at the moment, but they're launching a replacement later this year. So we'll take it back up to a few satellite constellation. Um, NISA hasn't been launched yet, but will be launched in January next year. I'll talk a bit about that at the end. That's quite exciting. But these, the great thing about this is it provides data for free. Um, we also use high resolution data um, from systems like um, ParisRx and the Cosmos Skynet. I'll show you some results for that as well. But our workforce is really this satellite central one constellation. Um, and part of the reason part of the reason we founded the company was because we knew this satellite was coming and we were going to change the way we could use the data. But instead of having to buy expensive data, process it, process it, charge all that to all the different clients, we can now process the whole country um, continuously and then sell that uh, to, to multiple users. So it becomes a much lower cost proposition. For customers like that we land. Um, so it's an operational radar, it's the first operational radar satellite system. Um, and it was also designed with Insel in mind. It's all full weather. The radars can see through clouds, um, image day and night. So they typically acquire one image in the morning, one in, one in the evening. Um, systematically acquiring data from the whole planet. So, um, and at least once every it should be once every six days, um, but at the moment once every 12 days. But because the, in the UK we're quite far north, the tracks overlap, so we actually benefit. Um, when there's two satellites flying, we get four images every every six days from almost everywhere in the UK. And it's designed for this technology, designed for the star. And what that means in practice is it's really boring. This the, the electrical engineers really don't like it because they like that fact that we can change the mode and have to use the factory here. That's, Focus on this target next next week, but with uh, the Sentinel, it's just the same. Every time they lay the same image again and again and again, and that's what we need for technology. Because they're making these very precise comparisons between the individual uh, images and the, the pixels. So we need we need exactly the same orbit in space. We need exactly the same beam sent out at time and time again. And it was funded for a twenty year mission. So we have one A launched in twenty fourteen, one B in twenty sixteen. We'll have one C um, later this year, and one D is also built and will we'll fill up um, to replace that uh, one A in that extra time. Um, and it's got this free and open data policy. So you can get the data free, you can do anything you like with it, you can build services with it. Um, okay, so um, having said all that about Sentinel One, we do use some higher resolution systems as well. Um, so, just one example from some data from the Cosmos SkyMed satellite. So Sentinel One has a spatial resolution of about it's, a, it's an uneven pixel size, so it's it's five meters uh, east west and about twenty meters north south in terms of resolution. So it's a kind of moderate we call it a moderate resolution system. Cosmos SkyMed has a three by three meter pixel size in this particular mode. You can also do more targeted acquisitions with this, but you if you pay a few hundred uh, euros per individual acquisition. So if we build up long stacks, it becomes expensive. Um, they kind of measure the same thing, but of course you get more points with here, and that can be uh, really useful for individual assets. And in this case, I think you can, uh, yeah, you can see it. Hopefully, this is the uh, Thames Highway um, sewer system that they've been building over the last few years in London. And you can most of it actually go London with under the Thames, so you can't see it. There's a bit here, this spur that goes up, uh, and you can see that red line in both of the Actually, but obviously it's not sharper in the um, Cosmo Skynet system. And, and I couldn't just show this, this plot, which um, uh, because what you can also do then is look at individual locations along that line, and you can get each one, you get a nice time series like this, They're typically nice and flat, and then they drop and they're then relatively flat again. And of course, they're dropping when the tunnel, uh, the boring machine is going, going underneath them. So in that case there, it's March 2020. Here it drops in June 2020, July 2020, August 2020, September 2020. So you can kind of track 
uh, the the uh, underground worm going through here, which is a you know, really nice application. Um, one thing that's useful, you can see how long it takes to have this initial initial sign, but there's some variability. Some of these actually have a longer term trend, and there's some longer term settling, and some of them are, some of them seem to settle very quickly. So that that's obviously useful uh, information, uh, well, particularly if you 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 uh, an asset owner owning something that lives uh, or you live on top of the uh, water tank. So. As was mentioned, so SatSense, I founded with my colleague uh, Andy Hooper um, in 2018. Um, in the company, I think this is probably out of date now, I think we've got more than 80 years combined experience developing these technologies. Um, and we're really uh, growing quite rapidly in terms of working both the UK and overseas. And our mission really has been about trying to make these data sets accessible and, and useful. It's quite a, a difficult technology uh, to get your head around and, and actually uh, understanding that technology, building applications so people can do things with it. So we do this large scale processing, we keep huge areas up to date, and um, that's then instantly available by various means. Um, we can do things like tailored risk in the that I'll talk about later. Uh, we can basically, we're pretty flexible, we'll deliver the data in whatever way you want. You can go to self-service portal. I'll show you at the end that you can the um, network mail's geo Rhinum viewer you can now access this data set uh, within that directly. Um, yeah, and we've got lots of uh, lots of exciting things there into the lab and going on before you. That's a sales pitch only most. Um, but um, what I guess what ne Never Rail, one of the things they really wanted to know was how reliable is this technology? Um, where does it work? Where doesn't it work? And that was a big focus of, of, of the early work we did uh, with the Tower and Beat project really important early goal. And we did this uh, particularly um, with sites in Kent um, and worked very closely with the Kent uh, team. Um, uh, many of these are of uh, these sites of interest were monitored uh, with brown banks measurements. And we were quantifying the controls on two things really. One was one is kind of coverage and one is noise. So coverage, and I'll just explain what I mean by that. So coverage is really where do we get measurements, where don't we get measurements. Um, and so we looked at a buffer around the track um, and, and quantified that. And so the bottom line there is about half the sites really in the So um, at less than 20% coverage. But around a third of sites have more than 40% coverage. And obviously that's in pen, and that will be different in what it's paid. Um, and the other thing we looked at noise. And so here's, this is uh, the East Coast mainline, just as it goes into Wakefield. And that red area there is um, an area of substance, ongoing substance due to the um, from the uh, mining legacy there. Um, and you can see there's two different points I've picked up here. One of them is relatively smooth time series, and one's quite noisy. And they does vary, and that depends on the quality of that scatter. So I mentioned before, you know, things that are very stable, nice buildings, you know, things like that, um, give us really good point measurements. Um, but other places, really, either with vegetation or places uh, where the scatterers are changing, car park, apparently, people park in different places uh, every day. Um, you know, so you don't get very good signals there every time. Um, but here we go, we have a histogram of noise. Um, so the numbers don't mean that too much. But what we did with these was essentially made combine those to give a, a, a rating. And the bottom line was that INSAR is useful or potentially useful in 60 to 70 percent of cases of the particular sites that were of interest. This is uh, 76 sites that um, we were given in Kent. And the nice thing is you can assess that by just by looking at the data you don't um, uh, and, and particularly now it's in geo and I'll show you later. So the main controls here um, essentially it's the density of vegetation. So this is these, these three graphs show the uh, this is our quality, so 10 is high quality, uh, uh, zero is low quality. Um, where you've got sparse vegetation um, or bare ground, uh, bare ground rock uh, or grass, you tend to get that much better quality than when you've got breathing. Um, when we look at railways specifically, uh, urban railways tend to be slightly better than rural, rural railways. Interestingly, when you look at a, a, a map of uh, the network, a map of our points, 
we typically pick up the railways everywhere because um, in the rural areas we get better reflections from the railway than we do from the fields around it. Uh, actually, in the urban areas, because of, of the vegetation, you typically get it's almost the opposite. You get worse signals sometimes along the urban railways. Um, so yeah, I, I'm just kind of summarising what I just said. But another thing to note is there's a wide range here. So for the rural, we're going from like zero to eight for rural railways. So it, it's not entirely predictable, and it's always worth worth a look. Um, and the other thing you can do is if you haven't got good signals, is you can kind of artificially force, you know, force your hand and put in some artificial reflectors. So these are corner reflectors. This is um, next time you're in London, this is Waterloo Bridge. Have a look on the side of Waterloo Bridge. There are these little corner reflectors that, that we're involved in uh, pressing in. Um, and a few different designs of those. But the idea with the corner reflector is if you imagine the radar being coming in, it's a bit like hitting a snooker ball into the corner of the snooker. A table basically bounces and comes back the way uh, you sent the signal in. So if we look at some real data where we put in a corner reflector, so here's um, here's a here's a patch of ground where there isn't a reflector, and these plots show the kind of the, the raw kind of phase measurement, and basically it's just kind of random noise. And for this site here, you can see when you get a reflector, you get this much brighter amplitude. It kind of leaps out in the in this image here. But you can see we go from this random phase to this much tighter signal. So if you've got one of these reflectors, in, you can typically the accuracy then is about you know, relative medium. Um, and we've been been trying for a long time. So we've never really bought some of these to put track side, but I'm sure you'll again be much more familiar with bureaucracy getting things to put track side. Um, and so they're, they're not yet actually installed with a cycle with some of well, these are going to go and the pets. Um, but so hopefully this year will have to happen. Um, okay, so that's really about the quality. So we can do things to, to control some of the quality by putting these reflectors in, but we do get some nice signals even without uh, the artificial effect. So I think there are four ways then that we think that this inside data can be used. Um, the first is to aid monitoring of known sites of concern. The second is a kind of screening activity uh, to look for um, uh, um, look for sites um, with anomalous movement. Third is kind of looking at things occurring over the boundary fence that um, normally you don't have access to. And then the, the more speculative way about the lead. So Let's have a look at monitoring known sites of concern. So we can go back to this uh, functional monitoring mm -hmm. slide. Um, so this has been known about, I think, the problem since the railway was built. The first draft from 1915 of a derailment um, there. Um, and here's uh, some of the data. Um, broadly speaking, you can, you can see there's this pattern of red at the top here and blue at the bottom, which is kind of, uh, in simplistic terms, a, a big rotational landslide that you've got from it. Um, and again, you get these time series showing the ground movement which those points. And if it's not steady, it, you know, it's a steady substance, but there are periods of acceleration, periods where it's more, more flat. So what we tried to do was there's lots of ground-based measurement there in folks and Warren. So one of the things we've looked at is trying to compare those ground-based measurements. These are typically FM taking on a peg that's that's hammered into the, the ground and then they're surveyed with a with a total station and they're set periodically and track how much they move. So each of these triangles is one of those um, um, survey pegs um, and it's we've coloured them by the velocity um, in the direction of the satellite looking. Um, so you can see just visually here there's a good correspondence where we've got these red colours and places to be red. And so the squares are then the average of the cell points um, in those areas. Where they're white, it tends to be white. This is the data as you're going from South to north. Here's the data as you're going from um, north to south. So you're seeing different magnitudes uh, because we're, we're looking at that different sensitivity in that different direction. Um, so we're seeing uh, seeing those different changes. And that's consistent with movement down here. As I said some substance at the top and some up there. And you can look at individual points and see. This is an entire time series, the one closest to this individual peg point. And you can see here the peg movement data. 
and here's the insert and extremely good correspondence for that one site. Um, you know, of course, I might have cherry picked, but I promise you I didn't. And here's all of the data plotted on a kind of one to one um, graph showing um, the, the movement relative to the start of each time series, comparing the, the peg displacements with the insert uh, displacement. So there's a this is for an, an, at an individual time, the time you make your peg measurement, there's a standard deviation of about eight millimeters difference between between the two. Or some of that's your error in your peg measurement, some of that you're in your inside measurement. I think the peg measurement is probably more accurate. Um, the INSAR, um, so just to summarize that really, so for, for known unstable sites, we can, um, I think the great advantage here is you probably still want some insurance on the ground, but we can densify that. We can look at the wider picture um, so we can increase the measurement coverage in space compared to ground based surveys. And we can also sample them more densely in time. So we're getting measurements every six days um, rather than uh, however often. But obviously, your peg measurement, depending on how often you can send with engineers to go and survey those sites. Um, the, um, they can, of course, reveal um, unknown features and historical movements in particular. So we can get, because we can go back to um, 2015 with a particular satellite. There are other satellites that we can go back further. Um, but so if there's a site that suddenly starts moving or suddenly is known about, you can look, okay, let's get this data, let's have a look how long has it been moving, what kind of movement have we got? So it's a really useful investigative tool uh, for uh, the engineers. Um, and of course, that ultimately we think will reduce monitoring costs and reduce requirements for boots on the ground. So, of course, that's that's one use. We think there's a use case also in um, screening networks for anomalous movement. So I guess the, the, the hope here is to identify areas of long-term movement before that failure occurs. So this is East Grinstead, where there was a landslide in, uh, in February 2020. Here's the inside data. It's a nice example where you can see we're getting points along the railway, but not in the forest on either side. Um, here's the time series. Uh, and this red arrow is the time of failure. You can see, obviously, there were some dramatic things happening after the failure, but there was there was about two centimeters of subsidence here that accumulated slowly over a, a three or four year period before that failure happened. So this was something that could have been picked up um, beforehand. Um, I think, in general, network rail are really good at identifying and remediating um, slow moving failures. There's lots of other technologies um, that also detect these. So we we but we think there's some improvement you can make by combining that with the, the inside to help prioritize the remediation works. So we wanted to test that really. And one of the things we looked at was how well can INSAR distinguish between stable and unstable sites in a, in a blind uh, test. So what we did was we, we classified a bunch of sites based on peg movement um, and the INSAR, and we did that kind of strictly and separately, in fact, we delivered those to uh, the steam and network rail uh, before we got the peg data. It was genuinely a, um, a blind test. Um, yeah, so um, we yes, we classified the inside, we classified the peg movement. Then we built one of these uh, kind of classic truth tables. So we've all got much more familiar with these code, right? When we were interested in what the specificity and all of that kind of stuff, you get the test. But here, really, the things to focus on, we want looking at the true positives, so places where there was movement and the inside said there was movement, and the true negatives, places that were stable, but the inside also said was stable, um, and the false positives. So, so this this is the, one of the key graphs here, I think. So where where stable behaviour was observed in the inside, um, basically, there's a couple of those. There was movement identified in the pegs, but um, most of them we got right. And then in, in the opposite sense here, where there was uh, where there was movement uh, seen in the INSAR, most of those were also moving. So a few false positives here. If you put that all in, in a table, you get that, which you end up with about 80% about of sites uh, classified correctly from this blind analysis, which actually I was staggered that it would work that well at all. But yeah, um, um, I shouldn't be so skeptical about my own technology, but um, you know, one of the several things here, really, the observation points aren't necessarily co-located. Um, typically, the observations are a different time period as well. So it's, it's actually 
really encouraging that it works as well. So I think this technology um, has the potential to identify sites of concern over entire networks at low cost. Um, and as I'll show you later, the network rail are now trialing the integration of the data within the geo range view. And um, I'll show you some screenshots of that uh, later. Um, we're also developing, I'll come on to that again later, but also more sophisticated ways of looking at uh, using things like uh, we won't be surprised in the read of people AI to try and classify uh, different components of the signal. So there's a monitoring site beyond the boundary fence. So lots of things, uh, construction, mining, waste dumps, um, can pose a risk. Um, and then often these are only inspected visually, literally looking over the fence settings in many cases to see what's happening. Um, here's just an example of that. One example, this is a, um, a big warehouse that was built next to the railway track and uh, distribution center near Rugby. And you can see here, these um, beautiful settling signals that have um, slowly affected the, uh, the track here um, in different rates in different parts of the, uh, of the track. Um, here's a um, overburden mound at Shotland Surface Mine near near Newcastle, um, and you know, this this uh, this mound here is, is we're not getting signals everywhere on it, but here we're getting some nice um, signals, and obviously that's right by the track, and so there's a real concern that that could slump, um, as we've seen elsewhere happen. And again, you, you're seeing some quite uh, significant movements there, about six centimeters in movement away from the satellite for that particular point. And uh, in this part of the world, we see, or to the south in the, in the coal mining areas, um, we see a, a lot of movement here uh, because of the legacy of, of, of the coal mining industry. Uh, so there's still ongoing substance in some areas. In other areas, we get we're getting uplift. A lot of it depends on the, the water pumping regime going on, many changes in that. And we can, we can see that very directly. Any change to that water pumping regime it impacts the surface quite, quite immediately. So you can see here, this is just a, the inside data measured along the track, and you can see that there's one area where you've got quite significant uh, subsidence right underneath the track. So I think this, this monitoring of the wider railway network can identify unknown movements occurring beyond the, uh, beyond the boundary fence, help identify the causes of any track movement. So if you have some anomalous track movement, what's going on, um, you have a look at this data. Um, and potentially we can provide alerts where the impact could be threshold levels. And we've been working, we've just got some, uh, uh, doing some more R&D work with the, uh, the mining and tunneling team to really just uh, explore uh, a few sites for them to see what uh, <laughs> we can see. Um, so the fourth one, I think, is alerting. This, this is pretty hard. I think this is the hardest of the things that we've used that technology for. Um, it can work. So this is an example from uh, a paper by um, uh, Sakti Selvathimaran, who uh, um, is an engineer at Cambridge. Um, and she did this nice study of Tancaster Bridge, which I'm sure many of you will remember, um, collapsed in uh, 2015 um, um, due to scour of the base. Now, this is this is from a high resolution satellite. And you can see that most of the time, this point here that we're seeing the time series for is stable, but just before uh, the collapse, it did start uh, to move. So there was this very short in-person uh, period uh, before the actual collapse. Now, um, we see similar things in Folks and Warren. Um, this is, these are a bunch of different peg movements, and these vertical lines are the times of individual failures, uh, uh, specific slope failures. And you can see the sum correspondence with the, the movement of the pegs. And particularly some of them, you know, you can see these very dramatic movements are correlated. So we had a look at the inside data. Um, if you look at just the inside data between those two failures over a relatively short time period um, and colour those in, this is the location of, of that failure, and you can see the was movement there. Um, now, so now I said this is difficult. I think these are providing, so I work on earthquakes and uh, Earthquake prediction is one of those real bits of quack science. You know, as a lot of people go out and say, look, we could have predicted this earthquake. Um, but actually doing this, uh, you know, we like to predict things before they happen rather than after them. So um, 
So it's, it's quite hard to provide robust, reliable alerts without too many false alarms. Um, so identifying signals retrospectively is not a sufficient test, and this does require further research. Um, and obviously, as I mentioned before, you know, the timeliness of the potential issue here, we're only getting data every six to 12 days, and sensible one, um, you know, we're getting very rapid, you know, most bridge scale is probably much faster than that. Um, so it's not going to work all the time. Um, you know, we, we've got some prototype systems with delivering one for a, a, a water utility company um, that um, owns this dam here. So we do what we're doing there is we are looking at the kind of time histories of points and when they uh, they deviate more than they have been in the past, we're providing alerts. So this is very much a prototype system, and I think we're looking at building this in the future. But it's very much R and D at the moment. Okay, so I'm going to try and kind of wrap up. Uh, um, so give you a kind of summary of advantages and disadvantages, and then I'll just talk a bit about where some of these technologies going. I think. Um, so some of the advantages, so obviously we get this really accurate signal. So we're getting we're seeing things, movements, millimeter per year accuracy, uh, weekly uh, updates, uh, potentially can save money by reducing boots on the ground. Um, if the ground cover is suitable, we're getting this really high measurement density. So we're able to kind of map um, the features, you know, map the spatial extent of failures, four measurements every six days for Sentinel-1, and we can do a, a, a decent fraction of the network. Um, and we can see things over the fence and see what they're doing. Um, and because of it, we've got the archive, we can look back in time and see the history of movement along um, and, and, and easily view those alongside existing data set. Obviously, some of the disadvantages with the current satellites, we can have poor coverage in some areas of dense vegetation. Uh, which means you'll probably need, if you've got sites of interest there, then you put it, you need to put in an artificial reflector in order to be able to continue monitoring. Now that only, of course, allows you to monitor the future, but not allow you to monitor uh, that site going back into the past. Um, we will miss very rapid movements because of the temporal resolution. Um, the sensor one data might be too coarse for some applications, and the high res data is more expensive. So these things are getting changed through time. And we're sensitive to vertical and east west, don't have much sensitivity to north south motion. Um, so, you mentioned that we're, we've got this data now integrated within the GeoRinum viewer. Um, so, this is something that's happened uh, just this year. Um, so, this is a little movie showing, uh, showing a kind of an interaction with that. You can, you can, nice thing is, you can see it on top of the LIDAR, you can really look at where those points are located. You can pull out the individual time series. So it's a it's a, a nice tool. And we've been running a series of, of workshops with members of uh, the teams to try and introduce people to the technology. There's a user guide, etc. So um, um, we hope that uh, we'll get some feedback and, and build something that becomes more and more useful um, as we go on. So that's that's an exciting development for us. I think this, incidentally, the way this works is it, uh, it live all the data from our database. So we have a fire API. So when you want you to do a it sends it, but gets the data very well quickly, but it's starting to make lots of things. There's always add up the data as well. So we, we process the data as soon as the satellite comes over, we process it, process the data as soon as we can, typically with it with a within a few days to a week to be updated with time soon. And that's already come up with a few nice Results. This is a recent one from Hook Embankment. I think that, that was the same one in that interactive portal. Um, that was closed in January 2023 after a heavy rainfall. Um, and, you can, and actually, there was movement on the southern side of the embankment that seemed to have been occurring since September 2018 and then started to accelerate in the spring of 2020. So here's September 2018. You see this little dip here. And then we've got some more rapid movements uh, later on there. Um, Another one, uh, this is Noonan Viaduct. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, again, uh, this was closed in April 2023 after significant structural defects were identified. And again, this is post, post uh, failure uh, prediction, but again, there was some significant movement that was occurring 
um, since the summer of 2021. Yeah, so that's about five centimeters or so. But the, so we are we are seeing that was, that was one area about it. So I think that's quite exciting. And it's really nice that engineers are getting their hands on this data, looking at it, playing with it, telling us what they'd like about it, what they don't like about it. That will help us improve the product, hopefully. Um, so the other thing we're doing is looking at risk indices. Um, um, and because it's not just the movement that matters, right? So actually, you can imagine if you're in a town, the whole town seems to be in really fact your house, right? You, your house is going up and down, it doesn't really matter. So it matters if your neighbor's house is going down and yours isn't, or vice versa, that's going to break pipes, or if there's a bit of the track that's moving. Um, so what we've been trying to do is take the data and look at, calculate things like the amount of bending, the weather is accelerating, whether things go up and down with seasons, do with clay shrink swell, you get some big movement that way. So trying to extract um, useful information from the data that's beyond just that movement time series. And then we're using kind of AI based approaches. So that's, that's some of those different uh, risk indices um, to combine all those to create risk scores. And that has to be tuned for individual vectors. So we've done some work in that with rail, but we've also done some work with port utilities in the UK and overseas to try and tune these indices to look at what are the things that most likely put a pipe failure or it's going to impact the current. So that's work in progress as well, which I think will get better and better. Um, as these technologies can improve and all the data sets can improve. And you can do things like this is um, this is um, a map of some of those risk indices. That, these are red, these are supposed to be more red, and it's coming out a bit faded on the screen. Um, but you can see this is just mapping some of those risk indices, some of these are along the long rail networks, um, really looking at this case red and the green traffic lights. So the other thing I think that's going to change. Uh, this technology going forwards is uh, some new satellite missions. I think two of the most exciting ones um, are um, this one from iSight, which is extremely high resolution, so better than one for spatial resolution. Um, and they have a constellation of something like, for the moment, it's about 21 satellites, I think. And they're at low Earth orbit, um, sort of all flying behind each other. And, and because of that, you can end up, you can get daily images um, for not everywhere yet, but you will be able to get daily images everywhere. Um, so that will solve some of those issues, but it's not going to be free. It's going to be expensive. Um, and it's not going to be tax sense making the profit. It's going to be by so making the money on that. But I think for high value assets, that's potentially an interesting technology. Um, and then the other one I think that we're excited about also is uh, NISAR, which is a, a NASA um, a joint S collaboration between NASA and the Indian Space uh, Agency. Um, and that's a global um, moderate resolution, uh, it's moderate to high resolution system. So that would be six by six meters. So that's a little bit better than Sentinel. Um, and it's in a different wavelength. So um, uh, Sentinel's in C band, which is a six centimeter wavelength. Um, this nice cell will be L band, which is about 20 centimeter wavelength. Because of the longer wavelength, it kind of sees through the leaves a bit better. It deals with this vegetation problem. So we typically get much, much better coverage um, in vegetated areas. And that's also yeah, free and uh, global. Um, it's only a single satellite, uh, but we should get a couple of images every 12 days in the UK. Um, but that will have to be launched next year. So I think that will be will complement the central data we might which would give us better spatial coverage, maybe and slightly better spatial resolution, but um, uh, a little bit worse temporal resolution. So all, all these things uh, can be brought together, I think. So I think just to wrap up, um, Aptons INSAR, um, I think they correlate well with ground movement monitored by network rail, so there's a really nice uh, uh, link there, and even in the blind testing. I'm sure that the data can be useful by identifying sites that are unstable. The quality at the moment is dependent on um, um, ground cover, so vegeta vegetated areas work poorly, and it doesn't yet work for locations. <coughs> um, but it's matured in the past five years, and I think it's really a proven, robust technology now that's beginning to play a role. 
complementing existing technologies um, in asset monitoring for the rail infrastructure. And so we're excited to see the architecture in network lane. Um, the um, technology is still developing and improving rapidly. So um, watch this space and happy to answer those questions. Very brilliant. Questions? Depends where you are. So we're a little bit conservative when we try and you know, just look at points that we can connect all the way through. But um, we've got something we haven't rolled out yet, a kind of experimental product where we just kind of skip over um, that one point. Yeah, if you want to have more than one That does seem to work. The challenge is in some places, I mean, it's working out places where you can go back to skip over the summer. Um, you know, if you've got a farmer that their field, um, then actually that's going to randomly change the phase. They will be disconnected short time season and working to help it. Now, do you do a straight line through them? But what if it's seasonal? The definition that it should be going down and then back up again in winter, um, which clay soils will be. Um, so that's why we have to roll around trying to work them and how to deal with that. But yes, you do get better coverage in the winter unless it's snow. Is the difference in quality of data from railway like the like north, south, east, west? We did look at that um, and forgotten the answer. There was, there was not much in it. I, mean, um, I can look it up in the report because it's one of the graphs we made and I, uh, I can give you actual numbers. But I, I think it was more, it wasn't as big a difference as before. But obviously, in principle, you've got more, you'd expect more. I think the north, south ones are slightly better than the east and west, but it wasn't as big a difference as we thought. And I think that's because obviously the reflections from the embankment, embankments or platforms are going to be better when we're on the north, south ones, but then you're still going to reflect, how to get more reflections off the rail and, and, and other, other, uh, other things from, you know, on the east, west ones. So it wasn't quite as big fast as we thought. Uh, but I can look up the actual numbers. Um, yeah, and it's not causing no harm. So that's cool. yeah, yeah, it does vary. You see it a lot in buildings, um, to give a higher resolution distance, but um, where you really get you know, the size of the building, the spacing, the fact that it's lots of things. Not common sense. Yeah, so I work in the network students. Okay. Ian Brooks has been great and good at implementing excellent technology now. Even if like, people get challenged when we're discussing airports, you can have a look at the inside to see what that could do. Right. Uh, one of the things we still, I think, still struggling to get is when we want to put reflectors in. Yeah. And say, what, what do they need to look like? Because I think the cost is still a bit prohibitive. Mm -hmm. And there doesn't seem to be a, a really cheap, low cost solution that just echo across the earth to that. Yeah. I mean, that, these things are fairly. But the C band satellites, they're fairly robust. So they're about a uh, kind of a meter uh, size of the metal core cube. So the actual reflectors themselves, I mean, if we were starting to mass produce them, they'd be a few hundred pounds each. Um, Do they have to be that big? Do they have to be metal? Just ask this kind of question. They have to be. Well, this is, we have been doing some RD on them. So we've, we've been experimenting with. Smaller ones where you have multiple reflectors within a uh, metal. Um, now, the challenge there is because it's an active system, if you get that wrong, you, they can interfere with each other and basically cancel each other out. You get this kind of interference. So you have to be careful. Um, we had a project where you can you can predict this based on the design of the structure. So, one of the things we I think you could do is um, build, if you're building an embankment, you could build it it's almost like doing reverse stealth technology, right? So rather than so you make it build it so it's really like the way down to build lots of angles and you know, have it but have the have corners that are pointing in the right direction. Um gravel, thick gravel embankments probably work quite well. But the things you could do probably that's cheaper than um I think the fact but I think the main cost, the challenge we have is not to I think this cost is still reflected. It's the actual how we then 
attach it in a way that can get signed off by the health and safety people I can have blow on the track and start people drilling it into the ground, attaching it, concrete that's playing the pop start there now. Um, you get better results, you get better in the metal, um, but you do get reflections of any, any surface flat. Um, so you sort of concrete from the wood, yeah, in the field. I think it's got to basically be have a, um, yeah, it's got to be something that the radar energy will bounce on. Oh, the dialectic property of it. So, uh, most, most of the time, you can uh, obviously that now is a school method as well. That's another problem. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the simplest thing you can do is clear the vegetation, but that's not necessarily the optimal solution. Yeah. Creating a flat surface on the, on the yeah. work itself. Yeah. Flat, flat. You know, I, I think, you know, when it's kind of an engineered slope, you know, you, you know, there's bolts and things in it. And I think that's probably quite going to be quite good um, by itself. But if it's vegetated, that's the real problem. No, so it's spreading no signals. It's you not know, so looking at it's really high bit of band. It's going to be looking at it. 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 It's going to be looking yeah, focus needs to have the IT claim AI tools. We need to use the help and say, okay, but then actually look and identify these sites and then more training the sites. Yeah, the backing the AI tools as well. Like, that was good as what we've done. We've been training on quite a list of all the failures, but some of them, yeah, some of them are highly little failures, but it's hard to. Probably wouldn't we now receive it in the installer. It's a find the right one. Uh, can you go back to New Vegas, please? August 2021 is down to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when, when did you get brought in then? Well, I think this is only to come about because I think what's happening is places that have had significant failures. Um, so I think Stephen and his team have gone kind of looked from all failures and said, oh, look, we could have seen it. Um, so in, in this case, we've we've only had the data in the in the uh, geo and viewer since what was it, like January? Something like that. I don't I think. think it was the latest Here's one we missed. Maybe, 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 maybe. Yeah, so it's really we've been. had the beta version, yeah. It's kind of got live. Yeah. 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 I bet it's been more than seven years. <laughs> Yeah, just two years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's been pretty. Okay, this is, yeah, as far as the inside, obviously there's scatter there, but there it certainly seems to have been, been fair, two years. Inside, you know, well, <laughs> people have stood there and I think you've seen it. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the crap. Right, yeah. Is there a question online? Oh, well, while we're waiting for that one, go for it. Yeah. How far could that go? I think again, the more the more twenty. Yeah. 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 No, indeed, and I think that. So the actors, the two things: the, the coverage question, and one of the things if you go high resolution, of course, you know, if you're in a you can sometimes see between the, the bushes and decks and you can like, you know, um, out that way. Um, but then the, the accuracy, because the accuracy depends on it on the wave, and this is a this is a shorter wave for that. Um, um, and but that doesn't mean you, you can you can make uh, precise measurements with it, but you because it's requiring data every day, uh, you're also benefiting from a huge amount of data you can back. To feel the detailing noise that way, that's a major problem for many. So, um, we already think with Sentinel, there's places we can see signals that are 
maybe as only as small as you know, less than half a million there you are in some of them as well. We've got really nice capital. Um, but I don't know, I think this will be similar probably. But the, the challenge is, yeah, I think the main challenge is going to be what, whether they can come up with a sensible pricing model that will be this useful. Because the lot data and the big cost delivering data and also letting post it's going to be. Can we adapt about the mega volume to the medium to the price model? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. In the drones, the next for having yeah. the drones run by satellite daily. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And they have a, a system that they do sell where they, they're not, they don't make a measurement of these, but they look at um, what's called the coherence, which is basically has anything changed. Um, so they can track, uh, if you're looking at an optical image of kind of tanks or something like that. So, um, uh, then, then and if the tanks move, then it changes the radar scattering. Um, and of course, you get a measurement there, but you can get these very precise measurements of when things have changed quite nicely in this technology. And that's a little easier than building with defamation time series. Your question online. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I think that, that could be doable. I think we can do anything I think is possible here, but I think that would be an obvious use case. So, you know, here's some sites we're worried about. Let's have a look at those and then just flag when it's the movement's above a certain level. It's all that fairly straightforward, is it? But it's any easier than me. Yeah, so the question then is, when do you issue the alert? Um, you know, and I, and I think that's something that may have to be done in consultation, right? because you don't want to be getting hundreds of these every day to look at, um, but you also don't want to miss out on things. Uh, I it's the scheme that has been asked. Yeah. Yeah. And two, two data related ones. The first one is how big is that? It looks like a loaded interview written pretty quickly. But yeah. It's not, so it's very low data size. And stuff that's actually, that you're actually sending out the door, as it were. Yeah, I think I did cut a, I did a, cut a little bit of the video and it's double speed, but it's still, I think, <laughs> a real speed. <laughs> real speed on here in it. I don't know, you've done it, actually. Yeah, yeah the, only, the only thing is we're only allowed to draw a certain area. That's right. That's, that's, that's uh, really you can't, yeah, yeah, no, you can't, you yeah, can't yeah. draw like a ball in the back. Yeah. Yeah. But we do have, I can pull it up on the screen. We have, we our portal, you can see the whole country and you can zoom in. It's really, really fast. Um, but I think because of the limitations of pulling in the it's, it's, it's it's only it takes a it, few it's seconds. Really right? quick, it's just the area that you draw has got to be a little bit big to something that yeah. square thing that's in. And the other question is is um probably is difficult to do for cancer too, but I'll ask it anyway. Um data training, so machine learning, yeah. I, I would imagine this is really difficult to get enough data to do that. But it sounds like you're having better than big success on it. So because yeah. it, it Okay, so you take something like the, the play line pattern recognition trade, that the machine learning, but it's got terabytes, terabytes, yeah. I think, yeah. but this is like single or double bigger uh, samples. So how does that work? Yeah, so I think it works okay, but we'd like more, now obviously you'd like more training data. The training, obviously the inside data is lots of it, but the training is that really small. If you've got under sites, I mean, it's, it's a still relatively small number for the machine learning. So, some of what we're doing, I think, might well. You know, so what we've done, so we, we have a live system that we've implemented for volcanoes in the academic side, and that what we do there, we have quite good models of how volcanoes behave when they perform. So we've got some real examples of real defamation, but we've also made up a whole bunch of models, um, and you can do these tricks where you flip, flip these down, parts by down, and so you can kind of take a small number of times. Multiple there are lot of risks involved in yeah. faking data. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. 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 and particularly when you don't know the type of the space. Yeah, I think it's, it's not easy. And um, what we've, we've found for the water utility company is that when we've done it, we've kind of split their data into two, training half and uh, an assessed half. And we end up, if you use the inside data in combination with what they already know, the geology and 
high flying environment with over. We add about 40% power to the predictable power with carbon integration as well. Um, and, and it's particularly powerful at that that, um, that small end of your, you know, they they might replace 0.1% of their high network every year. But actually the, identify the worst life with something and of course we're back to that. Um, and so yeah, but it, it is the training side is hard. Uh, going back to you, Brian. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, how far back have you gone? Before they So this is May 2015 in this time series here. Yeah. Um in other words, the bridge is breathing. Yeah, I think um, it's, um, how much of that is error and how much of it is real? That's a good question. Um, I think because um, I would think the bridge has been breathing, yeah, due to changes in um, groundwater or pore pressure. Yeah, I mean, um, think, I think it would be interesting to, I suspect, the mixture here. I mean, if this is no, that's 10. So I think typically we're getting uh, a, a few mil to a, so, but that, nothing in there that I would say leaps out and says it's leaping out above the noise until you get to that peak. Um, but it doesn't mean it isn't, it isn't a real tickle in there. Um, we see for other bridges, um, well, you see in other places, you know, where this where the soil shrinks well, we do see quite big movements there. Um, but that's quite um, the or for other bridges where it's thermal expansion, you see that as well sometimes. But I think oh, do that's the point that point bridge would be interesting. <laughs> yeah. 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 Have we seen that on clay, well major clay embankments? Do we do we, do we really see that's that seasonal? Yes, you do in some places. Sure. Yeah. We had a lovely example here in New York. Skelton Bridge over the river in the late 1980s, we started getting worried about this. Um, and um, we called in City University for photogrammetry, and we also did precise leveling. And we got accused by the um, tutorial engineer at the time, Brian Davis, that we didn't know how to bloody level um, because we said, Oh, it's, it's coming up this week. And they said, oh, it's going down now. And it was actually going yeah. up and down, depending on the um, full water yeah. uh, pressure, um, because near the bridge, you would then got a, a natural rise with a church on the top. You only built churches where ground didn't move. And the water level was going up and down, and the bridge was breathing. Yeah, you definitely see that in some places. I'm not sure whether I did enough. I believe it in this particular example from those two data points on this slide, but but certainly other places we definitely see exactly that behaviour quite commonly. Yeah, and obviously that's something we've been we've also got a one of the one of these risk indices we've been pulling out is exactly a measure of that of that kind of seasonal breathing. Because you can you can look at you know, not only the kind of amplitude, but the where where what's the peak, when does it go up, when does it go down. And so then you can tell the between the kind of thermal expansion and the, the moisture. Okay. Good question. Why are you saying that happened after the event? Have you ever chance to analyze that thing when you were triggering the, the warning? Because obviously, you see it's heat now. And yeah, it's yeah. It's looked quite severe, then it levels up. So you yeah. don't have to analyze when you think, yeah. like, oh, we would, before that closure, we would send you a because you can see it peaks to five million. Yeah. Let me go back to the one where. Well, so. Yeah. I guess this is it's not so different here. This is the one example from this um, this embankment here, which is slowly moving that way, actually, in some places. But what what we've done so far, in you know, not particularly sophisticated thinking, but you know, you put you train it on um, you know, the, the, the basically average in the typical scatter, and if it exceeds what it's done. Uh, you know, by two signal or something, you, you, you then put an alert. We're going to do that five percent of the time. Yeah, yeah. So exactly. So I think here, gone up and then it 
well, I think you, yeah, sometimes they go back down again. And this is, I guess, the way you need a question and a discussion with the people uh, responsible for it. Uh, in this case, they want to know if, it, if it's moved outside, as soon as it's moved outside, they get an email. But it might be in the case of the. Um, yeah. Yeah, this was now I think here you would, you know, I guess if I was doing it by eye, I'd probably trigger something about here. You know, where it's where it's clearly moved outside. It's you know, it's probably six months before the failure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And actually interesting, you've got multiple points doing it, haven't you? So um, yeah, these are the sort of things you'd look at in the data. Sometimes when it's a single point doing something with you know what's better for Excellent. Great. Great questions and a really fascinating talk. Uh, Gareth's glaring at me as if to say we need to be out of the building at a reasonable time. So I'm sure there'll be lots of chance to, to catch up afterwards. Um, so Tim, thanks for a really fascinating talk, really interesting technology. Um, and I guess it's useful to see how we can use it on existing sites of instability, but also use it as a potential predictive tool as well. Uh, in, including that that mining application, not, not just spying on neighbours alongside the railway, but understanding what's happening uh, underground as well. I think we can watch our house that how it's keeping down here. Uh, yeah, if, if, you, if you have substance yes. at home, this is the place to. Uh, yeah, when you, buy, you yeah. buy a report from um, Brownshore when you buy a new house, then it has some of our data in the report. <laughs> so uh, if we can thank Tim in the usual manner and. Uh, <laughs>
So, once you're in, I'm going to do some sharing. Okay. Let's I'm going to do it like this. Your internet's very fast, indeed. Yeah, there we go. We're in. So, is it Castleford around here somewhere? Exactly, yeah. To put some place names on, and then I'll just put them in. There's all sorts of different, yeah, that's it. So, all sorts of quite dramatic movement around here. Yeah, well, this is it. It's That's Ponty, so we need to go. It's Castlewood Centre there. Yes, so if we zoom in on. So, it's this bit here, actually. So, the middle of that is where I'd be interested to look at. Yeah, so actually here is this this bit here is the so, yeah, I mean there's yeah, so that's so it's interesting because that's not quite enough width of embankment to necessarily get a reading yeah. on the resolution. It's more yeah. for a bit more of a broader yeah space and it's, it's it's just useful to see what yeah what, so what you're seeing the data so it's like some bits where you're getting a signal yeah so, where you're getting a signal so you start picking yeah. up yeah okay. then you can look at kind of individual so there there was something in 2019 by the looks of it on there yeah. it's um there are some sites on there for free if you go on satshot.com you can there's yeah. a few places there where it's free to look like, at. Well. South Sense, yeah. Yeah, okay. if you go on South Sense website, yeah. okay. you can have a look at our demo portal and then a few places so, where we've got free data. Okay. Other places. Uh, if you just, yeah, sorry, if, I you, can, if, I, if you strip this table, I'll just pop yeah. it back in position. There we go. I will. You can move it as I use. Uh, and it's just to rotate this bit around. That's it. Oh. Wait, wait, wait. The only table, table earlier, yeah, that's true. Control. Just put this back oh. in here. Yeah, it's always going to be solid in the top. Third Friday month or whatever it is, you know. So, right, I'm just going to dive underneath. Sorry. Yeah. Oh. Just log out of here. Yeah, I hope you've done the full training. <laughs> 